So far, our collaboration was I play the lead guitar, lead electric guitar in the European premiere of his Mass. He made a uh, piece for the, the inauguration of the Kennedy Center. It opened it in 1972, I believe, uh, his version of the Catholic Mass. And then he asked the Yale School of Music to mount a production which traveled to Vienna where we performed it in June of 1972. I think it was July 73 at the Concert House, very elegant concert hall. And Lenny showed up to supervise the production. And he, I bonded with him. I mean, he was a hero of mine in music because of his Young People's Concerts on CBS. He gave me quite a good education. That was the first time I really had delved into music, Ostravinsky and Mahler and Ives and other great composers, and he was a fantastic educator and really great champion of music. And he encouraged me, he said, he was the first one to give me really big props for my guitar playing. You know, I came to him for tips on how to approach certain aspects of the piece. The piece opens actually with the electric guitar playing, a chord that rings out totally in the clear. And so I had that pressure on me every night to play the chord. You know. <laughs> It was a stretch. Everyone's hearing it. Yeah. Now that was a Catholic mass. You didn't, your parents didn't feel different. About well, yeah. I was raised as a Reformed Jewish person mm -hmm. uh, in the tradition. My parents were raised uh, by Orthodox Jewish people. Uh, well, Lenny was very Jewish. I mean, but I mean, who's to say that uh, really, you know? certain things would be off limits. I mean, if you have a spiritual nature and you're interested in trying to find a unifying principle amongst all the believers in the world who believe in a deity, you know, I think it's always a healthy and a good ecumenical policy to investigate other religious practices because there would be, out of this I'm sure, many similarities among the traditions. So for Bernstein to take on the Catholic Mass and do his version of it, which actually, you know, was quite an entertaining theater piece that threw in all sorts of music. I mean, you know, Broadway show tunes and uh, dissonance, 12 tone sections and jazz and rock. <laughs> that this was a, a very healthy creative impulse. Now, was this during your Yale years, one yeah. at the same time? Yes, I was attending Yale as an undergraduate then. I was in my junior year. I just saw a sign <laughs> listing wanted, you know, uh, for the upcoming production of Leonard Bernstein's Mass. And one of the things they were looking for was an electric guitar player. So I said, oh, that sounds like a job for me. And I submitted myself and met with John Mossetti, who was the conductor of the Yale Symphony Orchestra at that point. He was a really lovely guy, very nice and very enthusiastic, very capable conductor. And, so and a protege of Lenny. Oh, really? Yeah. Because I heard that you were a little scared. Well, not scared, but for Captain uh, Beefheart. Uh, yeah. For Beef but your well, but see, I hadn't yet played with Beefheart. I was interested in Beefheart's music. And actually, in the year I did this, it was like two years after I'd seen Beefheart, I was in touch with him and talking to him. That was still down the road. So this was, I would say, my first large-scale professional experience and appearance on a world stage. Then did, he, did he know you did that? Because I know... Oh yeah, I told him about it, and he was quite impressed. I mean, who wouldn't be? Bernstein, when he died, the New York Times headline was, Musar, Music's Monarch is mm -hmm. Dead. You know? He was just a, a giant. I mean, you know, you love him or hate him, I loved him. I mean, you couldn't fault the guy for his, you know, he was a whirlwind and a volcanic force of nature. He really, you know, just, he embraced and, you know, and communicated the sheer joy of music, which was the main, the title of his most famous book, The Joy of Music, on his programs and, you know, conducted in the New York Philharmonic and other orchestras and recordings and, you know, he just was uh, just an exceptional figure in music. He loved jazz. You know, he went down and saw Ornette Coleman's early appearances. Mm -hmm. 
in New York. He was like always trying to keep abreast of what was contemporary and happening in music and you know, finding similarities that would unite such disparate genres as jazz and classical music and you know, an encyclopedic knowledge and love yeah. and feel of mu for music. And I think this is also good. This is very healthy to be able to really embrace the other. You know, many times people coming out of a strict classical background are quite snobbish mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. also hostile towards, you know, the popular music or rock music, you know, whatever, prevailing uh, music of the day. They're elitists, many of them. And, uh, uh -huh. you know, I, I don't, you know, see, to me, it's like life is too short and I myself can find something of value in pretty much every <laughs> genre of music I've ever heard. And, and polka music, for instance. I've heard some great polka music players. And, you know, I can get a, a drive a sense of satisfaction listening to certain polka pieces. You know, something, you know, there's no genre so lowly and despicable that I couldn't find something of value in. I'm lowly and despicable, I put in quotation marks. You know, in the eyes of most of the world, let's say, of, you know, inferior music or... You know, not mu music not to be taken seriously. I think it's all bullshit. I think, <laughs> like, you know, I'm all about trying to... I'm a great unifier in that way. Well, of course, that's why you have so many diverse... Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a blessing and a curse, though, because if you ask, you know, five different people, what does Gary Lucas sound like, depending on the five records they may know of mine or appear to, they could give you five different answers. You know, I've done uh, over 20 records in so many diverse genres. So I'm about breaking down barriers in music and uh, trying to get rid of labels. I think they're inhibiting. People use them as a shortcut to thinking, you know? It's like when there was a Tower Records <laughs> in New York, everything was all neatly codified, you know, like a library, and you know, here's your jazz section. And, you know, what about crossover? What about stuff that really falls between the cracks? I mean, it's a big old world out there, and it's like you can't really codify it and do a taxonomy of all of it. You know, it's just, it's, it's impossible. So, <laughs> I, you know, I understand why people do this because it's sort of like, a, yeah, it's like a shortcut to really investigating and evaluating and, you know, people don't have the time. Basically, it's such a busy, rigorous old world, you know, so. I think it's, ter you know, it's like, I like technology to a degree, but I'm not a slave to it. And then frankly, you know, I'm more uh, actually old fashioned insofar as, I'm, you know, I, I fall back on my roots, which are American blues and folk roots. That's what I really grew up listening to. And, you know, those are largely acoustic sounds in nature. I find the sound of these like <laughs> synthetic tones very annoying, honestly. But you know, given the right setting for them with like you know massive beats, they can be pleasurable too. It's just that my ear really is more attuned to uh, to to acoustic music, acoustic orchestras, acoustic jazz, acoustic uh, guitar. So the '80s was a. Yeah, I, I like a lot of the 80s. Wait a second. So I'm very good friends with Claudio Brooken, who sang in a fantastic underrated group called Propaganda, which was also described as ABBA from Hell. And they were produced by Trevor Horn, who was like the first producer to really get into sampling in a huge way. You know, with a Fairlight that was sort of like post Moog synthesizer. Fairlights were the first sort of you know, yeah. usable sampling apparatus. And he did these great records with Yes, like Owner of a Lonely Heart. And you know, everybody was like, whoa, what's that? Mm -hmm. Frankie Goes to Hollywood, they're wonderful yeah. productions. And Abba, you know, had a song called, no, I'm sorry, Abba, uh, I like it, uh, uses a lot of sampling and whatnot. I got nothing against it. And done well, it can be great. But largely, you know, it's like, I don't know. There's something a little bit synthetic about it that grates on my ear. I'm not a purist, per se, because I mix up all sorts of things. <laughs> but it's like, when it becomes too much like work, you know, figuring out how they made these things, or, you know, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I wouldn't do stuff like that myself. I'm just not inclined. The older I get, I have to say, I'm more into simplifying things down to essences. Just 
we were training to be gold miners or something. I'm not that old. Though. But you know what I mean? It's like I used to run around the world with tons of effects, jumping up on and off trains. You know, last year I did this oh, a yeah. couple of shows in Germany and Austria, and I almost had a heart attack running for trains, you know, lugging around all this baggage of basically you know, guitar effects, which are basically, you know, it's like studio gim crackers. It's like not, you know, they're toys. And it's like, I can make, I can dazzle people just with my finger picking. So wh why bother? You know, I'm a one-man band just with a finger. <laughs> you know, and all my, I'm one of the best out there, so I just like don't care anymore, you know? <laughs> Someone wants to pay me lots of money to bring all the toys. I'll do it, I guess, but see, it entails like your overhead goes up. You gotta hire a roadie and a guitar tech and a sound guy to that's really right. get it sounding right. And after a while, it's like, is it really worth it? No. I'm more uh, about the intimacy of communication these days, and I find it most expressive in terms of solo shows with acoustic guitar. I'd say that's the direction I'm heading. I mean, I've flirted with it over my career. I mean, I had an acoustic album, Evangeline, I guess when we did video with it all of 15 years ago that it just came out. Yeah. And uh, it was well received by the critics. You know, I didn't really get to tour in that format much. But uh, I aim to do more, you know. I just got a booking in Munich uh, in March. I'm gonna do an acoustic. I'm gonna do uh, an acoustic show up in Boston. And uh, I don't think anybody will ask for their money back. Anybody, you know, who saw me with effects, they're spoiled, so uh, we wanna hear those electronic things. I mean, and I do, and can do, Amazing things, but I want to get paid, you see, <laughs> in order to like bring them around these days. So, yeah. well, I'm sure you welcome the Czech Republic after your uh, yeah, that was the 14th anniversary of the Bell Dance. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I just did a benefit up at the Bohemian National Hall uh, two nights ago that was great, uh, and hung out with the ambassador Martin Palouche, who brought me to do the Czech classical music project for the 14th anniversary of the Velvet Revolution. And also Marcel Sarr, who runs the Czech Center and the, and the Czech Council of General. Uh, and yes, I have a soft spot in my heart for these folks and uh, that region, principally because my father's father came from Bohemia. You know, uh, was a Jewish man who emigrated. The family name was originally Lichtenstein. That's Stalin, Bernstein, Lichtenstein. You know, it means a stone of light. Yeah, but what does it mean when you break <laughs> it down in German? Lichtenstein, stone of light, like a coal, you know, a hot coal or a diamond. I like that. And whoever changed the name to Lucas at Ellis Island knew what they were doing because the root of the word Lucas is uh, lux in Latin. I mean, it's lucent. It means light, giver of light. Lucifer. <laughs> so that, you know, was a nice uh, transmogrification of the surname. So why didn't you decide to uh, major in music? Why didn't I decide yeah. to major? Because it was too much like work. See, I came out of the Deep Heart School, which was music is just black ants crawling across white paper. That's what <laughs> said. And the idea of like, you know, reading what many musicians refer to as like, you know, fly specs which is like dense pages, or Zappa had this piece called The Black Page, just lots of notes. Mm -hmm. It's great technical feats, I'm just not really adept at it. Uh, I never was, I probably could have gotten my head around it, but I would rather pursue other things like writing and reading, literature, that was my real love. I loved music just as much, but again, you know, I, I never studied piano. The first music course I took, and I only took one, class at Yale when I was a freshman. Mm -hmm. You really needed some keyboard experience to be able to function in that course. So it was like, well, I don't have this and you know, I have other fish to fry. It was also, there was too much of a grim professionalism about it. There was something about work of day musicians and I'm not putting anybody down any specifically or in groups, but just as far as my own sensibility, I've always been a loner. I find that, you know, there's a sort of an aspect of a, uh, of a union head, you know, I mean, not just the musicians' union, 
but you know, studio cats as opposed to recording artists as opposed mm -hmm. to touring artists. There's a hierarchy of snobbism there, and I wanted to avoid all that. You know, I thought I'm going to do it in the words of Frank Sinatra, my way, which is I didn't really have to. I just have a great ear that I know. You know, I took in a music aptitude test in the sixth grade and scored a perfect score, which is why the band leader in Syracuse, New York, where I grew up, assigned me the French horn to study. Quite a ridiculous task, as you can see, I barely have an upper lip. I never could make a good embouchure on it. But I played the French horn in bands and orchestras in high school and junior high and enjoyed it. You know, I wasn't that good at it. In college, you also played? No, I never pursued it. You know, I stopped. I was thrown out of the band in Syracuse for oh. wearing sandals. The band leader was a very <laughs> conservative Jew, a fascist, <laughs> who had ideas about, you know, he was freaked out by the encroaching psychedelicization of the youth culture in my era. <laughs> he really was. And, you know, so any manifestation that included long hair or sloppy dressing, you know, dressing code violation. Unacceptable. Yeah. I also was thrown out because he caught me improvising <laughs> once on the French horn <laughs> in one of the pieces we were playing. And, you know. I thought I was enhancing it. You know, that's my impulse. I have a record called "Improve the Shining Hour," which is, you know, it's an epigram by Isaac Watt, Scottish author, that goes, "How doth your little bumblebee improve your shining hour?" Or something like that. You can look it up. I thought I was making the piece better. I was jazzing it up, as they say. Uh, well, I didn't like that. It's like, you don't play it as written out. And that's one problem I have with classical music, you know, per se, is that there was too much, uh, it was a bit too regimented and more like an amorphous and drasmous uh, kind of a gathering. So, and I like to blur edges around things. Not that I can't play it. Don't get me wrong. You know, like I played Bernstein's music and I got the score and I learned it note for note. But luckily, there was also an improvisatory section you know, in this wild bacchanality piece, which gave me a bit of a you know, problem because I thought, right, the guy is using electric guitar to represent here the force of anime in society. You know, when it's a sun piece called I Don't Know, that he cries like, you know, horrible trends in post industrial society, drug abuse and adultery. All the fun things, and uh, well, <laughs> okay. you know, he, that's where the guitar was. Inst you're instructed to crank up and wail on the guitar, and I thought that's how he sees, you know, a rock guitar as like a, this. See, it's interesting. It's uh, he Lenny, if you know his history, definitely embraced the Dionysic aspect of life. Uh, one part of it, you know, it's pretty well documented, as most people do at one time or another. And, uh, you know, he might have enjoyed a loud, cranked up, distorted electric guitar. On the other hand, he knew there was something essentially blasphemous about it, so it sort of was used as in a postmodern, you know, uh, a structuralist way. It was signified, you know, forces of darkness and dissolution of the core rotting in a society. So, you know, I, I had a problem with it because I think it can be beautiful too. You know, it's all in the eye and the ear of the beholder. One man's meat is another man's poisson. You know what I mean? I know that you work uh, with CBS Records yes. as a copywriter, creative director, <laughs> associate creative director. I wrote lots of ads for them, for many different artists, including Lenny. Classical division of Masterworks. I also produced a record for them. I also worked for uh, the pop division and wrote ads for Bruce Springsteen, one of my favorites, who actually is a big fan of my guitar playing. Uh, Michael Jackson, The Clash, Judas <laughs> Priest. You know, I wrote lots of different ads. Now, how did you go from? I know you worked it for around 13 years, right? I did. And how do you go from learning, you know, one day saying, you know... Okay, well, that's an interesting thing. story. What happened is this. Uh, I got that job in 77. I just moved from San Francisco with a wife in tow. Mm -hmm. I had just gotten married. We 
my Chinese sweetheart I mean, <laughs> Taipei, Taiwan, that's another story. And, uh, well, I needed some sort of secure income, so I got a job uh, there running ads, and they first started me out freelance, and because I was so good at it, I was made a staff copywriter. And I worked there for 13 years, but in the interim, played and managed, played with and managed Captain Beefheart, who was a hero of mine from, from childhood. And, you know, they allowed me to do that and keep the job. I took leaves of absences and vacation time in order to record and tour with him. And then he decided he just wanted to do painting. Uh, I hooked him up with the Mary Bloom Gallery, Julian Schnabel. And then, uh, you know, he didn't want to do music anymore, so I kind of resigned from managing him too. There was really nothing more to be done. I wasn't interested in just being his art pimp. And then I was looking for projects to engage in, you know, because that had been sort of my principal focus creatively for the five years I'd spent with him. I had this day job, but again, I could sort of do it by remote control. It was not very taxing. Uh, but it was a sinecure, you know, it was a steady income and health insurance involved. And uh, so out of boredom, you know, I felt like I really got to start doing my own thing. I must have something to say. What is it? I don't know. But, uh, you know, I knew I was a really accomplished guitarist. Finally, I put my mind to it and uh, mounted a solo show in 88. And despite all, everything done to, that might have like, you know, sabotaged the, my debut here in New York, it was sold out. They turned many <laughs> people away, many people away. And I got several ovations. They handed me a fistful of money at the end. And that was a turning point in my life. I said, this is what I should be doing. Why did I wait so long? I was already 36. But I vowed to myself, now I'm going to hit it as hard as I can in music. Because I saw a, a window of opportunity still. And I was determined to play my way out of CBS, which is what I did. You know, quickly in the ensuing couple of years, I put together the first version of Gods and Monsters, my longtime band, which mm -hmm. just had a 20th anniversary show. I put together the soundtrack to the German expression of silent film, The Golem, which I'm going to perform this Friday. Here we're taping in January. The last day of January, mm -hmm. performing on Friday, February 5th at the Rubin Museum of Art here in the old party. Uh, I started collaborating with other people. I just got serious about it. Not to the point where I became a studio musician, you know, and did jingles or something. <laughs> you know, that wasn't what I was interested in. And it was more or less, I, was just, I knew that I had talent and I had something to say, and I was determined to do it. You know, by golly, I like left the day job in 90. At that point, I had a contract with Columbia Records and a female singer who was the first singer I worked with in Gods and Monsters. That's another story, but in any case, from that, you know, I have a checkered history, but definitely there's been a, a slow and steady progress upward. You know, here I'm speaking to you from the vantage point of at least in over 20 claimed international solo records on various labels. Indie labels, but good ones nonetheless. The most recent of which, Rishte, collaboration yes. with the super Indian vocalist Najma Akhtar, made number four on the world music charts in Europe this year. From Britain, she's from Britain also, right? She lives in Britain, yeah. yeah. Family is Indian. And uh, so, do you know what I mean? I mean, if you look at my, go to GaryLucas.com, you will read, the best reviews money can buy, <laughs> except I didn't buy it. You know, I paid for it with blood, sweat, and tears to achieve them. And uh, they're all of them. Every record I put out got four and five star reviews pretty much across the board in major publications internationally. Acclaiming me as a guitarist. You know, most recently I was cited as one of the 100 greatest living guitarists in classic rock magazine, which is not nothing. It's a big classic rock magazine in the UK. Uh, with a large circulation. Mojo magazine, you know, they just cited me. I'm on a cover mount CD with mm -hmm. a collaboration with Amorphous Androgyny this month. Uh, the New Yorker called me the thinking man's guitar hero a couple of years ago. Rolling Stone called me a modern guitar miracle. 
two months ago. <laughs> so I must be doing something right, you know, and that's why I keep going. Despite, you know, people's attempts to push me into one pigeonhole or another. I know why they do it, you know, and uh, I've always sort of resisted classification, although it hasn't made things easier. It's just meant that I had more of a creative latitude to keep working, you know, and that I did it, I did what I wanted to do, I'm going to do what I want to do. You know, that's a, a big part's credo, and that's my credo too. On the other hand, I do have the concerns of anybody making a living at it. So, uh, let's say to be so all over the map is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you uh, eschew being pigeonholed, but then, you know, it's hard to describe what it is you do. As I mentioned before, to people who don't know your work, it's sort of like a lot, lots of stories and footnotes, and, uh, you know, before people can connect the dots. And, but on the other hand, it's also a fun, it's kept me working because when one thing wasn't working on one project and one genre and things got slow, I could glide over here mm -hmm. to another one, you know, and, you know, hopefully continue to do that till I drop. That's what I intend to do. I mean, <laughs> I really love playing for people and making records and touring. I mean, that's a joy. That's what I always wanted to do, and I would encourage anybody who has any creative aspirations to go for it. I never would discourage anybody attempting to do anything in the arts. I mean, as difficult it is, I'm a realist and I know how tough it is, but I would always give encouragement. I think that's what's sorely lacking in the world. In a world of jealous and cynical people who never are happy with their own situation, so they continue to deride and belittle and pick apart people's honest creative efforts out of just spite you know, and sheer begrudgment. And I think that's a terrible policy for them and the world, you know, but particularly karmically. You know, life is too short, and I think you should be here to encourage people. I like to do master classes and meet young people, and I'm always giving them encouragement. I tell them my particular story of what happened to me and or how I perceive things. They can take of it what they will and reject what they want, you know, but what strikes them as true and leaves a resonance with them, I think, is something worth imparting, and it's authentic. Do you have taught semesters at, at colleges? No, you know, I'd like to, but uh, I've usually been kind of busy trying to just, you know, live from gig to gig, unfortunately, <laughs> so it's hard to make a commitment in the long term, but if there are any interested uh, you know, faculty VL. <laughs> out there, yes, uh, I'm a very good teacher. No. And I liked the History Boys, that play on Broadway very much, you know, the last line of which was, pass it on, boys. That's what we're here for. We're trying to, you know, keep a continuum of knowledge in the culture, right? Because it will enable succeeding generations to better come to grips with uh, all the, you know, the, the, the strife and, 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 and torture events like that, you know, are ensuing around us that we're all caught up in. And I think, you know, the problem, as I say, with lots of young people coming up is that despite wonderful tr tools such as the internet, which is a double-edged sword, I think. Uh, there is a vast, lamentable lack of a historical understanding of music, of rock music. It really doesn't exist much <laughs> anymore beyond last year to most kids. You know, unless they're very curious and they really want to get into it. Those kids I would appreciate. And I think the more, you know, information you can give people in a helpful way is what's all for the better. Of course, at the same time, you can't really tell anybody anything. Everyone will have to find out for themselves, but I always looked at people who were older than me when I was growing up. I preferred the company of older people who were mentors to me because, you know, I just thought there's a wealth of knowledge to be gained listening to this person that mm -hmm. I can't get from my contemporary who, as nice as they are as playmates, really don't have a depth of understanding mm -hmm. of information. Mm -hmm. But it's true. So. Now, with your, you said you, had, you moved to San Francisco with your wife. Yeah. Uh, did you meet her when you were working? I met her in Taipei, Taiwan. And in fact, she's responsible for... Edge of Heaven? Yeah. Uh -huh. One of my best-known records, which is sold over 10,000 in the world, which may seem a small number, but if you understand the economics of indie releases, this is actually a pretty significant sold uh, and it's about to be re-released this record 
The Edge of Heaven, Gary Lucas plays mid-century Chinese pop, came out on a French label in 2001 and received accolades all over the world. I got a major write-up for instance in Rolling Stone, the Wall Street Journal even had a profile in uh, NPR and uh, all over. So it was on many 10 desks of the year list. Did you meet uh, her? I met her when I lived in Taipei, Taiwan. I was working for my dad in for about a Yale for about two years. And she was some, uh, a, a woman I met uh, socially who like we you know, really hit it off and started living together. She played me the original recordings that the album is based on. What they are is pop music from film soundtracks, mainly films made in Shanghai, between the wars, when Shanghai was a free port. And a very interesting history there because you could enter and leave Shanghai without a passport, and it became a haven for European refugees fleeing Nazis, fascists, and communists. Many Jews were involved. Many Jews and many jazz and klezmer musicians. And these people found work in the studios, many. And uh, so this fascinating hybrid music kind of was created specifically for movie musicals starring Chinese female divas. Uh, and a lot of it is down to the inputs of the European Jewish jazz musicians. Uh, this music sounds so beautiful. It's uh, a very unique mixture of swing, Tim Pan Alley influences, Broadway show influences, and uh, Chinese music. So in Chinese, and often with Chinese instrumentation and sometimes with jazz orchestras. If you saw the film Shanghai Triad, with the great Gong Li, who's a friend of mine, then you can see sort of this milieu described cinematically. She plays a singer working at a nightclub controlled by a Chinese gang syndicate. I want to know how much survives. You know, someone should really go, I, I, I should be that person. <laughs> I, you know, I need a sponsor to send me there. Because there's not a lot of this culture left in Shanghai. If you know, they've torn down most of the dance halls and the what was called the foreign legation section where they had some of these beautiful art depot buildings. The best film to see, for an example of this, I would say, and you can get it in Chinatown, you can buy it on the internet. It's called The Angel on the Street, or Street Angel, I think it's 1937. And it stars the great Zhou Xuan, whose music I cover on the record. It's half Zhou Xuan, half Bai Guan music. And Zhou Xuan was called The Golden Voice of China. And this is a, her, her first big hit movie, and she's like an ingenue who's forced into prostitution by her family. She's the angel on the street. Mm -hmm. And it's just heartbreaking, and she's heartbreakingly lovely and sings like an angel. Uh, and the opening sequence of the film is a montage that looks like modernist experimental cinema of the 50s, underground film. That's basically Shanghai by night with all the neon in, in quick cuts. And it looks like Times Square from the 40s, you know, I mean, it's got that vibe. It's like the jazz age of China, an art deco age, an age of, you know, anything goes, opulence and decadence. And, you know, it's quite exciting to see there visually because it's actual footage that wasn't in studio created. Uh, but it's gone. It's like vanished, you know. I just played in Cuba and, uh, you know, they had a heyday too of nightclubs as you know before the communist revolution, but a lot of that is still there in a kind of faded, elegant way, intact. Almost like in the film Blade Runner, you know, when they show yeah. the modern megalopolis of this retrofitted building. It's like Cuba, like Havana, you know. And Shanghai, though, it's pretty much gone, gone, gone. It's all like torn down, modern skyscrapers. I bemoan this trend, I hate it. Uh -huh. when they, every, they yank down every building in the Lower East Side that I shot in. I really, you know, think it's like what has gone on with the real estate uh, cycle here in New York. It's just, you know, atrocious. And uh, so you're going with Cuba. I know. Well, first, I think your first performance of the Gong was in. Well, you first. I first did it at the Museum of the Moving Image in 1989 here in Astoria, which was great. And I did it with my collaborator, Walter Horn, mm -hmm. who's a great composer and keyboardist in his own right. 
And we did the project together on a commission from the BAM, Brooklyn Academy of Music Next Wave Festival. And it was very well received. And then he had to drop out of live performance. And I figured out a way to keep going and doing solo. But I would always acknowledge him because we co-authored half of it. And I love to work with this film, but I've now branched out and done many sound movie scores. The Spanish version of Dracula. Yeah, the latest yeah. one, which is interesting. Uh, if you know a bit about the history of the horror film, there's a great legendary Spanish language version of Dracula filmed at the same time as the Bela Lugosi Todd Browning 1931 Dracula in Hollywood on the same sets with similar costumes and pretty much the same script, although it's longer, with a different director. They came in at night. Instead of dubbing the film, which now they, mm -hmm. you know, to exploit the film for the Latin American audiences, they thought, well, we'll just shoot the film with Spanish actors. Yeah, why not? It's <laughs> a great idea. Now they never do such a thing. They just dub it. But that's what they did, and it's great. And to some film historians, it's a superior version because there's better camera work, there's more fluid editing, the it's better, it's longer. There's exterior scenes of Carfax Abbey that are incredible. God knows why they got cut out of Dracula. Mm -hmm. And they looked at the rushes of, you know, the Lugosi Dracula every day and said, how can we beat this? How can we make ours better? So this, what happened is uh, it's also famously absent of music, like Dracula. You get a snatch of Swan Lake at the top in, in the credits, and that's it. The rest is dialogue and sound effects. So when I, knowing this, I thought, okay, instead of taking a silent movie, per se, silent, I'm going to take this and create an underscore solo guitar version of my other scores I know. And uh, I was uh, made a proposal to the Havana Film Festival. I had contacts with them, and they were very excited. And in December, I premiered it there on a Saturday night, and it was packed at the Laurenta Cinema with a mixed audience of uh, families and blacks and whites. Latino, uh, the Latino culture embraced this performance in a big way, let us say. Uh, beyond my wildest dreams, it was a triumph <laughs> for me. I had an amazing write-up in Cuba's main newspaper, Grandma. And, uh, you know, it was just... Uh, I think you used to this already. <laughs> well, I've gotten great reception often, you know, not always, but this was particularly heartfelt. And I've subsequently been invited to perform the U.S. premiere at the New York Film Festival in the fall. So uh, I'm waiting for a specific date, but I expect it to be in September. And I hope to do a European premiere between now and then, too. That's what I'm working on. Thank you. I really like working with this film. I always had a soft spot for vampires. I was going to say that because you have the golem, you have... Yeah, well, see, I, you know, when I was a kid, I was very much uh, enthralled by horror films. And there was in the culture then a magazine called Famous Monsters of Filmland, edited by Forrest J. Ackerman, who died last year, God bless him, mm -hmm. which really warped <laughs> the sensibilities of so many kids growing up in that era, of the early 60s, such as someone like Tim Burton, would cite the film as a big influence. And, uh, I mean, a, a film magazine. That's how we first heard of so many of the great films. You know, this magazine was sort of our bible, and it brought you know to life all the great classics. That's where it first sort of developed, actually, in the pages of the magazine. I saw pictures and said, "Whoa, a Jewish Frankenstein! How cool is that?" You know, being a Jewish kid, and someone who liked horror. And also the cameraman's revenge. Well, uh, that's another, yeah, that's a great. Six. See, I do a project called Sounds of the Surreal. That was commissioned by the Film Society of Lincoln Center. They're good friends. And that is a 1912 animated silent film by Ladislav Starowitz, who was a Russian pioneer of an early animation who was based in Paris. And it was made, the film was made in Paris. And uh, it's great, because they used actual insect armatures yeah. for uh, the bodies of these 
tale of these insects, and it tells a tale of the last um, insect that Bell killed. It's quite fun. An early stop animation. Early stop animation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to perform that in Dresden, Germany, on March. I think on March 24th. Do you do it with, uh, with the, I think there's other two other. Uh, yeah. Movies, right? Well, in that Sounds of the Surreal, you have Ballet Mechanique by Fernand Leger, the great painter. He had one foray into experimental cinema. It's basically an abstract film. It's quite beautiful. Nonstop retinal assault mm -hmm. of image, imagery, still photos and cartoon titles and very wacky. And then also the great René Clair's Entrac, all from 1924, these two films. And Entrac means between the acts. And it was a divertissement. It was devised to be shown, I guess, in the Paris Opera House in between acts of an opera. I'm trying to think about it. It had an original score by George Antai, who was a modernist composer. So I made a whole new score, solo guitar for it, and I played that at the World Financial Center for John Schaefer's new science program in that school in Germany. Now, with the God of Monsters, how is that going now? God of Monsters is going well. We just played in uh, the new knitting factory, the Great Space in Williamsburg. And uh, we have a record that's in the can that Jerry Harrison from Talking Heads produced and played on. So I'm just waiting for the right moment to release it. The problem has been very difficult to tour large-scale projects these days anywhere, unless you can really hit it big with a fan base that would enable you to like command large fees. And because of the unwieldy nature of the group, you know, we sort of have to rely on being invited to play at specific events. Like we did a festival in Moscow two years ago, the Golden Mask Festival, which is Russia's largest cultural festival that was great in a beautiful chandelier uh, concert house setting. We played a festival, the South Kammergut Festival in Austria two, two years ago, it was in the summer, because they could afford to bring, you know, me, if I have to subsidize the gigs out of pocket, I'm not really interested in mm -hmm. being as great as the, gig, the, the group is. We had a wonderful gig at the Gramercy Theater in June, our 20th anniversary show, and lots of guests, including Lenny Kay and uh, Alan Vega from Suicide. It was a great night. So I'm sort of picking and choosing my gigs with them carefully. You know? I'm sort of <laughs> deciding when to release the record. I hope it comes out this year. I'm not sure. Now what happened, I know that Jeff Buckley, he originally was with it, and then uh, I think the first day you debuted it, or he Well, was he was invited in by me in 2009, <laughs> and, uh, in 91. And this was after I kind of lost a, a deal, it's kind of a sad story, with some, well, but then it was CBS Records. And he said, I'll be your singer. Mm -hmm. So we worked on a new batch of songs with a new lineup of the group, and he elected to go solo. He didn't go forward with it, which was sad for me. But I kept going. You know, I put out the first Gods and Monsters record on Enemy in 92, and the thing got four stars in Rolling Stone. Uh -huh. And uh, so that was encouraging, and Jeff was not on that record. So it was like, well, my career didn't begin with Jeff. It's not going to end with Jeff, but Jeff is great. You know, I love working. Possibly the greatest individual talented singer and all around musician I've ever collaborated with. I really miss him. You know, he was just wonderful. Uh, when he got his own deal with Columbia, he then called me up and invited me to come and record with him two songs we had co written Grace, Grace and Mojo Film. And to this day, people around the world write me or come up to me and tell me these songs changed their life. And see, this is one reason I keep doing it. Despite the difficulties of trying to be, you know, operating in a very crass and mercenary universe of, of popular avant-garde music, I guess that's how you describe my rock music. Or at least attempting to be popular. You know, it could be vastly unpopular. I think it approaches 
uh, you know, it has the potential to be popular. It's not, you know, it's not like purest music. You know, I'm always trying to reach an audience halfway in whatever I've done. You know, I, it's not just ugly melodies. You know, these are songs, these beautiful changes, and they're you know well crafted songs. I think I'm writing a really good song. Right Besides now. the audiologist, I think at that time with the yeah. <laughs> oh, you know the story. So all right, fine. Well. Yeah, but see, I mean, I do different types of music. I can do ugly noise too, you know, and I do dip into that bag occasionally mm -hmm. in, you know, performance with a band live. Or it's just, but I mean, it's another color. It's another, you know, it's like I look at the palette of colors available to work with, you know, as infinite, really. Why restrict yourself to just one expression, you know, of, of French ability or sound? So in any case, um, getting back to, what was your question? <laughs> I'm not really driven to be a multi-instrumentalist. I think any people who do that, great. My hat's off to them, and, you know, but it's just, I'm very satisfied doing what I do, and I think I'm one of the best. I don't really want to, you know, muddy the water so much now that I've established the beachhead of the guitar virtuoso. You know? <laughs> Many people would say, well, Gary can play anything. It's not strictly true, but on the other hand, you know, I probably can do versions of pretty much anything that's thrown at me to play. Uh, but, you know, it's not that insofar as the identity I want to, to be remembered by. You know, I want people to really remember my music, my compositions, you know, beyond the fact like, oh, he was a hell of a great finger picker, a great guitarist. <laughs> you know, again, I think like earlier you, know, you try and simplify and get down to essences. That's what I'm about now. The essence of what I do is still sort of trying to make psychedelic music in the best sense, the music that would change people's minds, you know, or alter their consciousness. If they change their minds, I want them to change it into accepting my music. All right, I'm doing a project called Gary Lucas Cine Fantastique on February 9th after the air date, of course, but I'll probably do it again in New York. But you I can can't. see there's a whole page of it on GaryLucas.com, check it out. I debuted it in South Korea. I played a film and music festival in Jashian, South Korea, in August. And basically, Gary Lucas' Cine Fantastique is my solo guitar version of famous film music by people like Nina Rota, Bernard Herrmann, Florian Frick of Popol Vuh, all would have heard of in his music. Alberto Iglesias, great Spanish composer, did a lot of Alma Zabata's mm -hmm. music. I'm going to do one of his pieces. This is a uh, theme by Alberto Iglesias to the film Sex and Lucia. It's a beautiful art film. Uh, I debuted this in South Korea the summer at the Jashian International Film and Music Festival. <laughs>
can play Wagner at a guitar. Mm -hmm. How about uh, the Overture to Tannhäuser? <laughs> <laughs> 